Hello, everyone, and welcome to God So Loved. I'd like to introduce ourselves again this evening, along with my wife. I'm Marilyn Armior. And I'm Michael Armior. And you are entering this evening into an eight-part series of something that will grant you greater joy and expectation for eternal things. And we're coming to you from Boise, Idaho, into your homes by TV, or perhaps at your local church. And we'd like to especially welcome tonight our friends in Vancouver, Washington, and... Around the world. Thank you, Michael. Dr. Jerry Potzer is with us again, and we're so glad we are lifting him up in prayer because of the messages that he's bringing to us are so important. This evening, he is going to share with us a message entitled, God's Covenant with You. Got some uh, brass coming right at you. It's called the Gospel Brass. And these guys are from all over the West Coast, and they're here to play for you tonight. And they're going to be here again tomorrow night. So I'll tell you what, if you didn't bring any friends with you tonight, bring them tomorrow night. Okay? And they're going to really enjoy these guys. So let's welcome the Gospel Brass.
Stanley Skarzynski lived his entire life in Chicago. He was born into a Roman Catholic family that had him sprinkled as a baby. He went to Roman Catholic schools and later he was confirmed in the Roman Catholic Church. In time, he finished his education and he became a landlord and spent most of his life as a landlord there in Chicago, thinking he would never leave the city. But he says that about eight years ago, God put an idea in his head and almost commanded him to move to the Northwest. It was a strange idea, but he drove out, drove through Idaho, Washington, Oregon, decided that Boise was the place, went back to Chicago, took about a year and sold everything he had, moved to Boise, Idaho, where he did not know one soul. After he moved here, he wanted to get acquainted, so he joined um, the gun club, joined a, a fish, went out fishing, he joined the Gold Prospectors Club. And he said, I, there's not much gold out here, but I finally found true gold. The gold that comes with knowing Jesus and knowing the truths of the Bible. He went to the VA hospital in Seattle for some work to be done. And they said, what religion are you? And he said, Christian. But that got him to thinking, where's my church? What church do I want to go to? And over the last seven years, Stanley has visited well over 50 churches here in the Boise area looking for a church home. He hadn't really settled on one until six months ago, he received a handbill invitation in the mail for some meetings by evangelist Lyle Albrecht. He looked at it and he said, here's a church I missed. I need to go see this one. And when he went, he started learning some things from the Bible he had never heard in his life. For example, he had been taught that when you die, that you just go to heaven. But he learned from the Bible that when you die, you go to sleep until Jesus wakes you up. He learned a lot of other things he had to process. And now, six months later, he has processed it. And he said, I want to be baptized and unite with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so tonight, because you love Jesus with all of your heart and you want to walk in the truths from the Bible that you've learned and you want to be a part of a people that surround the globe that announce the second coming of Jesus and invite people to prepare for that wonderful event, we now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, another important topic, and we are, as Michael Marilyn mentioned, moving toward the end of this series. It's hard to believe, but that is actually what's happening. So make every presentation count, right? God's going to bless. Well, a man once said, Pastor, Pastor, don't forget what the Bible says. God helps those who help themselves. Ah, you know something? That is not from the Bible, as helpful a saying as it is. Well, there's another one. Has anyone ever told you that the Bible says to err is human, to forgive divine? Well, the Bible doesn't say that either. How about the don't eat to live? Don't live to eat, eat to live. Now, oh, that's a good one. A rotten apple spoils a barrel. You could list some more of those. They go on and on. Well, they may be good guiding statements, but the facts are none of them are found in God's holy word. These are sayings that we have heard for such a long time. They've been passed down from generation to generation that we get confused into thinking sometimes that they have their basis in Scripture. Tonight, we want to talk about something else with much more significance than those little sayings. One that, unfortunately, many people wholeheartedly believe, uh, believe come from the Bible, but it doesn't either. In fact, there are some people who would probably be willing to stake their lives on these beliefs that we're going to discuss tonight. 
Now we can't possibly be experts on everything, any one of us, that's for sure. So many of the beliefs that you and I hold, we've inherited. We believed what maybe our parents, our friends, even our pastor has told us. And therefore, we become at times a little confused. And we forget the basis of some of our beliefs and where they came from. Even in Christ's day, did you know? There was a problem in confusing Scripture with tradition. Jesus talked about it in Matthew, the 15th chapter, and it says, And he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandments of God because of your what? Tradition. You see, the basis of people's belief had become confused to the point, in some cases, they couldn't tell, they couldn't differentiate between what was biblical truth and what was tradition. Jesus said, and in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrine the commandments of men. You see, God said that you and I need to read the Bible for ourselves rather than just believe what our parents, our friends, our pastors, or even what I tell you. Is that fair enough? The Bible has counsel regarding this topic. And I want you to contrast that with what Peter's statement was in 1 Peter, for we did not follow, he said, cunningly devised fables. Good man. Obviously, if we're going to have God's smile of approval, we want to be in that second group, right? Obviously. Tonight we're going to look at an issue that divides millions of sincere Christians, an issue that will become, I believe, a final testing point just before Jesus comes back to this earth the second time. It therefore has eternal consequences for all of us. We're talking about the Saturday Sabbath and what many refer to as the Lord's Day or Sunday. So tonight we're going to go back to Scripture as we have been through this whole series. Let's see what the Bible says in Genesis 2, 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Right at the very beginning of the Bible, we see this. Three times we find the verb finished or done in verse 2 and 3 of, of Genesis there. The Sabbath was instituted to celebrate the completion of his perfect creative work. Now, some would say that the Sabbath is a Jewish creation. We see here that God instituted the Seventh-day Sabbath with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden long before there were any Jews. Then we go to Exodus 20. Find God giving the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, symbolically written in stone by God's own finger. Great text. Many of you could say it by memory. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant, your female servant, nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now the importance of the Sabbath as a memorial of creation is that it keeps reminding us of the true reason why God is due our worship. Because he's our creator and we are his creatures. You see, God instituted the Sabbath at creation and as long as he is our creator, the Sabbath will continue to be a sign and a memorial. And so throughout the Old Testament, we see God's chosen people keeping the Sabbath holy. It was a special sign between God and his people. Moreover, the Bible tells us, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Down through the ages, God's people have not only kept the Sabbath, but the Sabbath has kept God's people. It's kept them to be a sanctified. It's kept them to have a sacred relationship 
with their very God whom they loved and served. Now we have six days to do our own work and recreation. And God loved us so much that he gave us the Sabbath rest. The great reformy, uh, reformer uh, Calvin, John Calvin, you know that name from your history, emphasized that when he wrote, under the rest of the seventh day, the divine lawgiver meant to furnish the people of Israel with a type of the spiritual rest by which believers were to cease from their works and allow God to work in them. Great quote. So we see that in the Old Testament, God's people kept the seventh day Sabbath. No argument about that. We would all agree with that, wouldn't we? Yes. Then we come to the New Testament, and we have Christ's example to follow. Of course, we know throughout his life, Christ kept the Sabbath. And then, when it came to his death, we come to what is referred to sometimes as Good Friday. Friends, I gotta say, there is nothing good about that Friday. Five trials, four brutal beatings, two flesh-shredding scourgings, just as the prelude to the crucifixion. And some may say it was just merely coincidental that Christ allowed himself to be crucified on Friday. But I'll suggest that it's significant to note that according to the gospel writer, Luke, that he died just as the Sabbath was beginning. It was the preparation day. Luke goes on to tell how his body was placed to rest in the tomb over the Sabbath. And then it says, that wet day was the preparation day and the Sabbath drew near. You see, it's important for us to realize this many years later that Christ resting in the tomb was a symbol of his accomplishment of the redemption of mankind. So we see the beautiful symbolic parallel. At the completion of creation, Christ the Creator rests from his work of creation. After the crucifixion, Christ the Redeemer rested at the completion of his redemption. Amen? So when we accept God's invitation to share the Sabbath with him, when we lay aside our work, our secular activities, our conversation, as Abraham Heschel says, even our thoughts of labor, then we participate in this beautiful, this wonderful creation and redemption. We express our confidence in, we accept that he is indeed the author and the finisher, as the Bible says, of our faith. And so we see the Sabbath represents the creation and the redemption of mankind. But there is a significant third symbol in the Sabbath. You see, after God delivered his people from Egyptian bondage, he enjoined the Sabbath rest as a reminder of what? A reminder of their deliverance from Egypt. After emphasizing the Sabbath commandment, he says, and remember, that you are a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by the mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So while we have seen that the Sabbath is a reminder of creation, it is a reminder of redemption, Deuteronomy portrays the Sabbath as a reminder of another significant act of God the deliverance of his people. Amen? Following me? In per to participate in the Sabbath rest for God's people, it was not to merely just stop, cease from manual labor and secular activity, all the conversations that go with it, but it was to be a holy experience, reminding them of the past, the present, and the future deliverance. Beautiful. So significant was this to God that he instructed his people so as to impact their entire 
society, their whole lives. You see, a slave back then enjoyed rest on the Sabbath, and a slave regained his freedom on the seventh year. The land itself experienced Sabbath of rest. They were commanded to leave it idle every what? Seventh year, right. And property sold to repay debts was returned to the owner of the, in the year of Jubilee, seven Sabbaths of years. And at the setting of the sun, unequal societal divisions leveled out. Samuel Thresher said it well. He said, although one Jew may have peddled onions and another may have owned giant forests of lumber on the Sabbath, all were equals, all were kings, all welcomed the Sabbath, and all basked in the glory of the seventh day. Amen? God intended that the weekly Sabbath rest would be a regular reminder of his release from the bondage of sin and suffering, not just from Egypt years before, but for everyone of every age down through the generations. I don't believe it was an accident. That Christ begin, began and gave us an example during his life and ministry on this earth, and that his Sabbath activities were highlighted there in the, in the gospel narratives. Five times it's recorded in the gospel writers' stories of Christ healing, intentionally healing on the Sabbath day. He was very definitively making a statement about how true Sabbath rest can bring liberty, how it brings deliverance and freedom from sickness and from sin. In fact, as we have seen, nothing in Christ's work was done by accident, so we can't help but notice that it was on the Sabbath that he officially began his public ministry. And he did it for what and how? By reading from the prophet Isaiah. This is what it said and what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable ear of the Lord. And so the Sabbath, and then Sabbath after succeeding Sabbath, God, uh, Christ not only preached and taught, he exemplified his ministry of liberation by healing the sick and forgiving the sinners. How beautiful is that? Can't you just imagine that each person that was healed on the Sabbath day was reminded as that Sabbath came around each week, week after week, of God's love for them and his liberating power. How sad that the religious leaders, motivated by the devil himself, would so twist the beauty of the Sabbath as to condemn Christ for doing his healing, liberating ministry. Sad. Christ, who himself established the Sabbath. And so in response, Christ proclaimed himself Lord of the Sabbath. Matthew says, and stated it further, the Sabbath was made for man. Yes, mankind needed the Sabbath way back in the Garden of Eden. It was needed all through the Old Testament times. They needed it in the times of Jesus. And we desperately, I believe, need the Sabbath today. This modern day rat race, 24-7 stress, pressures. We possibly need the Sabbath more than any before. And most of all, we need the Sabbath to remind us that he has given us victory over sin. Christ said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. What a beautiful statement. The Greek verb anopeo used here 
for rest is the same word as the Sabbath rest. In the light of the cross and redemption, the Sabbath brings rest and deliverance from all that sin and guilt that we tend to carry as human beings. So what about those who seriously believe that Christians should keep Sunday as a memorial to the resurrection? Well, certainly. The resurrection is an irrefutable fact upon which all of Christianity hangs for this life and the life to come. But Christ in no place suggested that the Sabbath should be changed. In fact, to the contrary. He believed his followers should and would still be keeping the seventh day Sabbath after his resurrection. How do we know? Because when he was asked by his disciples about the future, he said in describing the fall of Jerusalem, which wouldn't occur until 70 AD, that people should, as it says in Matthew 24, and pray that your flight may not be in the winter or when on the Sabbath. Furthermore, we find the theologian Paul keeping it. it says, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. The author of Hebrews writes from a Christian perspective. He actually urged Christians to learn from the Jews, he said, who failed because of disobedience to enter into the experience of the Sabbath rest. So Christ not only never intended that the Sabbath would be changed, Conversely, he saw that it would be an everlasting perpetual sign between him and his people. So there are physical and spiritual benefits for those who keep the Sabbath on this earth. But additionally, it is a foretaste of eternal joy and freedom in heaven. Isaiah the prophet Speaking of those who would inhabit the new earth, wrote that the redeemed would, well, let's pick it up here, and it shall come to pass from one new moon to another and from one what? Sabbath to another. All flesh shall come to worship. That's not speaking about here. That's speaking about heaven. And so how is it that millions of Christians keep the first day of the week? Ordinarily, in a series, I like to spend two nights on this topic. But in this abbreviated series, let me suffice it to state a few brief but important, significant points. Nowhere in the Bible, not even once, is there a command to or a reference about the Sabbath being changed. I want to read you a couple of impressive statements by well-known theologians. The first one, Cardinal Gibbon of the Catholic Church. And I want to say right here, there are many good, sincere people in the Catholic Church. We're not talking about good Catholic people here. We're talking about some, some of their uh, cardinals and leaders that have written statements on this topic. That's what we're doing here. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scripture enforces the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. Now, the Catholic Church knows that the Bible does not, in any place, authorize the sanctification of Sunday. According to the Catholic News Service, on September 9, 2007, Pope Benedict XVI urged Austrian Catholics to protect Sunday as a day of spiritual focus. The article went on to say that in an innovative touch, reflecting the Pope's attention to green, or conservation he was talking about, to green issues, he suggested that Sunday be celebrated as the church's weekly feast of creation. Well, it's true. Our creation is endangered. But the answer, friends, is not into attempting to try and change God's holy law, right? You remember reading from history about the Protestant Reformation. Men like Luther and Knox and Wesley, because the Reformation shook the church to its very foundation, a tremendous effort was made to restore the church to solid ground and once again regain credibility. And during the Council of Trent, which was dominated by the Jesuit order, 
and lasted more than 17 years, about 18 years, 1545 to 1563. A group of bishops, archbishops, cardinals, priests decided that if they were going to get the church back on solid ground, it would have to comply again with the Word of God and the Word of God alone. After all, that's what Luther had been preaching. Another group disagreed, saying that if the church were to again stand on solid ground, on a foundation, it must rely both on Scripture and tradition. And that argument, if you can believe it, was discussed and debated for the entire 17 plus years until finally at the end of the time. I think they were probably mentally exhausted. A man by the name of Reggio, Archbishop of Reggio, addressed the entire council. He stated that Protestants could never defend Sunday sacredness if they continued to offer as their authority the Bible and the Bible only, for there is no Bible council for the sanctification of Sunday. He said the authority of the church could therefore not be bound by the authority of the Scriptures because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by the command of Christ, but by its own authority. Wow. And this Catholic archbishop was admitting that if the Catholic Church were to take a stand on Scripture alone, on this foundation, they would have to return to keeping the Bible Sabbath. And if they were to continue worshiping on the first day of the week, Sunday, then church doctrine would have to stand on both Scripture and tradition. And based upon that presupposition, the Council of Trent voted that Scripture and tradition are equal streams of truth. And furthermore, they stated that if there exists a contradiction between the two, the church will rely on tradition in preference to Scripture. But remember, friends, what the Bible says. We read it earlier in Matthew. Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. This is serious stuff, folks. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I'm compelled to take my stand on Scripture. And I am sure that's the same for you tonight. It's interesting to note that the Catholic Church has actually softened its posture on this position, as evidenced by an apostolic letter issued by Pope John Paul II in 1998, speaking about the Lord's Day. Instead of boasting about the church's authority to change the Sabbath, as traditionally they have done for many years, the Pope instead attempts to base the pos his position, the church's position, now on Scripture, using the Genesis creation account as part rationale for keeping Sunday, no doubt realizing that their historic position was being effectively challenged. So why do so many Protestants observe Sunday as their day of rest in keeping with the Catholic tradition? Well, and again, many sincere, honest Protestants there were not talking about them or putting any of them down, but first many do it out of sincere ignorance. They have been raised that way, believe it. As I mentioned at the beginning of tonight's presentation, that their traditions have a biblical basis, when in reality that we see that it's not the case. And secondly, you will hear some say, it is a celebration of the resurrection of our Lord. And that is a nice thought. But there is no command in Scripture, including the words of Christ himself, that ever suggested to change the day from Sabbath to Sunday to commemorate his resurrection. And thirdly, there's a text in Colossians that's often used to support Sunday keeping. Let's look at it just for a moment. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross goes on, so let no one judge you about your food or drink or regarding the festivals and Sabbaths, new moons, etc. How many of you ever heard someone use that as a reason for keeping Sunday? Sure, you have. You bet. Absolutely. 
those who use this text would say that here Paul is clearly suggesting that the law was nailed to the cross. And think about it for a moment. It doesn't seem logical that nine of the commandments were left intact, but one commandment was nailed to the cross. But for the sake of the discussion, let's see how that position doesn't stand up under the rest of biblical scrutiny. First of all, there are 59 references to the Sabbath by the apostles in the New Testament. None, zero, of the other texts even hint that the Sabbath was changed. So when Paul's letter to the Colossians was received, they would have been shocked to learn that Paul was suggesting that the Sabbath had been changed. No, rather they knew from the writings of Moses all the way down to Malachi and from other recent letters that the seventh day was still the Sabbath. In fact, it wasn't even an issue in the New Testament church. They knew that Paul was directly referring to the ceremonial rites and service of the Jews that were nailed to the cross. And those included things like the temple services, the sacrificial system, even the Jewish ceremonial rites. And then finally, we need to look at those who would say, well, we are now under God's grace. We're not under the law anymore. We're under a new covenant, not the old Sinai covenant. You've heard that too. We are under the covenant of grace, which gives us liberty. Friends, once again, that is not what the Bible teaches either. The Bible tells us this, and I will walk at liberty, for I will seek your precepts or your laws. In other words, just like with the civil laws we experience liberty as we keep the law that I talked about the other night, it is not by breaking them that we have freedom. James wrote referring to the Ten Commandments as the royal law and the perfect law of liberty. He said if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well goes on, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Well, friends, there is no conflict between grace and law. They are in harmony. Amen? As far as a new covenant, it is not new in the sense of a different or something that's in conflict with the old. It is a new covenant as in renewed because God never changes. Amen? A prophet Isaiah predicted there would be Sabbath reform in the last days. Look at this verse. We're talking, he was talking about our time. Also the sons of the foreigner would join themselves to the Lord. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. He's talking about the people that would, the Gentiles that would receive his word. He wasn't talking about the Jews. What covenant is Isaiah talking about? What period of time in earth's history? According to the context of verse 8, it is the Christian age under the new covenant. Keeping the Sabbath was enjoined on Christians after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and after the ascension of Christ. And to those who would honor it, a blessing was pronounced. John the Revelator, a full half century after the resurrection, pronounced a blessing on those, as he said, and who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. And then this one from Hebrews, and Jesus Christ is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, only a superficial reading of Scripture such as John 1.17, would indicate that the law was given through Moses in contrast to some grace that Christ brought. No, they weren't in opposition. But again, that would call God's unchangeable character into question if that were a fact. So how does it happen that so many people unquestioningly began keeping Sunday? Well, during the first few centuries after the death of Christ, 
Many pagans began to embrace Christianity, and with them came some of their beliefs and their practices, including sun worship. For a while, both days were celebrated. One was more of a holiday, one was more of a sacred day, but as time went by, they tended to switch. And over time, Sunday became the official day of worship. And in 321, you remember that date, some of you from your history, Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival throughout the entire Roman Empire. Well, some here tonight that may hear, be hearing this for the first time may say, well, okay, I have to admit, it is logical to keep the seventh day Sabbath. And I see that it is certainly biblical to keep it. But still, does it really matter to God which day I keep as long as I keep one? Or maybe better, and I've heard this, I'll just keep all seven. Well, let's suppose for a moment that my wife Sue had six sisters. A big day of the wedding arrives and I stand at the church. I'm watching her walk down the aisle, dressed in that beautiful white wedding gown, veil over her face. But as she comes closer, I realize it's not Sue. It's one of her sisters instead. I'm a little panic-stricken. I lean over to my future father-in-law and I say, that isn't Sue. And he just smiles at me and he says, Jerry, it doesn't really matter as long as it's one of the sisters. Does it matter? It sure did to me or would to me. Sue is the one I chose from all the others to be my wife, and none of the six sisters, no matter how great they are, regardless of what their fine qualities were and what they might have possessed, can replace her. And friends, I want to suggest to you tonight in this humble illustration that even infinitely more, it matters to God which day we keep. The seventh-day Sabbath is the one that God chose. And if I love Sue, then it matters which sister I marry. And if I love God, it matters what day I keep holy. It is the one that he blessed and sanctified, and it matters to him. And none of the other days can ever replace his Sabbath. One of my favorite authors put it this way, true faith which relies wholly upon Christ will be manifested by obedience to all the requirements of God. From Adam's day to the present time, the great controversy has been concerning obedience to God's law. In all the ages, there have been those who claim to write to the favor of God, even while they were disregarding some of his direct commandments. But the scriptures declare that by works is faith made perfect, and that without the works of obedience, James says, faith is dead. Look at this. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. That's serious. Friends, this law was spoken by God himself amid the thunders of Sinai, written with his own finger on tables of stone, not in sand to be blown away. You better think long and hard before you accept, accept the word of any man or any church that says they have the power to change what God has commanded. The Bible says this, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Psalm 119 says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Psalm 111 says, 
the works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand and it goes on for fast forever and ever. How much plainer could God be? You see, down at the end of time, God has a special group of people right in the last days before he comes that he speaks about in Revelation 14. This is what he says. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. This group of people is very special because they are keeping the commandments of God. You may say, but really, are there that many people who keep the Sabbath? Ah, there are. Even if you don't count all the Jewish people, there are millions and millions of Sabbath-keeping Christians around the world. And the facts are that really doesn't matter anyway because down through history, generally, often, the majority has been wrong anyway. Tonight, I'd like to acquaint you with some very respected people who have faithfully and honestly kept the Sabbath. My Bible tells me that Adam kept the Sabbath, it tells me that Abraham kept the Sabbath, it tells me that Moses kept the Sabbath, and then Elijah, he kept the Sabbath too, David kept the Sabbath. How about Daniel? He certainly kept the Sabbath. We know Mary Magdalene did. Peter, he kept the Sabbath. We already talked about Paul. He preached and kept the Sabbath. And John the Revelator, he kept the Sabbath. My Bible tells me that standing head and shoulders above them all is our example, Jesus Christ, who also kept the Sabbath. And he says to each of us tonight, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yes, friends, God loved us so much, he gave us his Sabbath. I know you want to honor him by honoring his commandments, all 10 of them, just like his people have down through the ages. Think about your response while we listen to this beautiful song. Oh. Uh -huh. 
tonight is that that's what you want or you wouldn't be here and he says if you want me if you love me keep my commandments not seven or eight not nine but all ten through my power and through my grace but it does take a decided initiative on your part to say yes Jesus by your grace by your power I will tonight we talked about one of those if you have that card in front of you, if you're in this large auditorium, pull it out right now. And let me ask you several questions. Some will apply, some may not. If you're in your home, if you're at another venue, let me read those to you and you respond to what's appropriate to you. First, I understand that the Sabbath was given as a perpetual covenant between God and his people. We talked about that tonight. Let me just see your hands there in this auditorium if you believe that. Yes, yes, if it's your desire to follow that that and make that a commitment of your life check that on here or as we said before raise your hand wherever you are secondly I want to reconfirm my belief in the biblical Sabbath and enjoy its blessings yes can you reconfirm your commitment tonight after hearing this yes every hand and finally, because I do love Jesus, I want to begin keeping the Sabbath, as now I understand the importance of all 10 of his commandments. Now, for some of you, this will be a first time decision, but tonight the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart and you realize that yes, the seventh day Sabbath is God's perpetual sign between himself and his people. You realize that it is a reminder of creation, of redemption, and a continuation of renewal from sin. If you realize that tonight for the very first time, I would suggest, I would ask, I would plead with you to make that decision and to check that on your card or in the quietness of your room, your home, or your venue raise your hand right now and say yes Jesus I will begin keeping all of your Ten Commandments we're gonna pray before we do I want to just invite you tomorrow night as the pastor said a few moments ago when we were starting if you're gonna skip a meeting don't skip the next one there are a lot of people that have bumper stickers to the fact that the rapture is coming a lot of people don't know how that's all going to happen. I can tell you that there are millions of people that think they know that are all confused and they have it wrong. Tomorrow night, you're going to leave here knowing exactly what the Bible says about that great event that's about to take place. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the beautiful message that you've given us tonight as we realize this tremendous gift of the Sabbath, as we see that Jesus gave it to us for our benefit as a statement of our covenant relationship with Him, we just praise Your name and say thank You. Thank You so much. Give us the power and the grace to step out and step in line with all of those of Your people down through the ages that have kept the Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.